amen to that this morning? God, you are always up to something good in our lives, and we are so grateful for this morning that we could come together to worship you, our King, the Ancient of Days. God, we give you all praise this morning, for you are up to something good in our lives, and we want to feel that. We want to experience that this morning. So would you come, God? Would you settle in this place? Would you dwell here, and may we feel your presence? God, we give you all praise and glory and honor this morning. Amen. If you are joining us online, we welcome you. For those in-house, we welcome you. We are so glad that you are here this morning. I welcome you, too. I'm Kara. I'm the director of discipleship here, and I have a couple of announcements to get us going this morning. Today, we have a congregational meeting right following the service with some exciting business to discuss. I think you'll like this one, so make sure you can stick around for that. Um, Next Sunday, if you taught last year or you're considering teaching for our fall ministry, we ask that you would come to a meeting at 9.30 before our worship service next week so we can talk to you and get you equipped and ready for the fall. Next Sunday is also an exciting Sunday because we'll be dedicating Jeremiah Uick. So that will be um, fun to celebrate with the family. Also, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there is um, an S word that's coming up this week and next week. School is starting, and a lot of kids are dreading it, and some families dread it because of the financial burden. So if you are willing, next week we would like you to bring a gift card of $25 to Walmart so we can bless some families who struggle providing um, school supplies or school Uh, new school outfits for their kids, and then we would like to um, bless our families with those. And we'll also be doing a backpack blessing in the service. So if you are a student or you are a school worker or a school employee, you can bring your bag or your backpack so that we can pray over you. Also coming up on September 11th, we are going to have a Welcome Home Sunday, which is like a rally Sunday, and we will be gathering for worship outside And so we will have a picnic lunch, a potluck lunch, and we'll have a prayer walk and other recreational activities. So mark your calendar for that. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to invite you to stand as we worship our God who is worthy of all praise.
could run into my office and get my, my red acoustic. I broke a string. See, in the professional world, you have like 10 guitars on stage, but we're not as lucky to do that here. That's okay. God is still our sovereign. He's still our king. Beginning to end my life in your hands Great, great is your faithfulness You never let go This is one thing I know Oh, great, great is your Good morning. 
It's good to see you. Let's quiet our hearts before God. Spend a moment in silence as, as we come to him in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is our prayer this morning that you breathe your Holy Spirit on us. Come, Spirit, come. It is only with the filling of the Spirit of God that we can know you, that we can be equipped to be set apart for the ministry you've called us to do. So, Lord, we come to you today. There's a lot on our minds. We might even be so distracted by issues or problems or things that are going on in our lives that it's hard to even sit here and pray. But we will do our best, our best to give you our full attention. Quiet the voices in our heads that tell us to worry or ignore or doubt. Help us to hear only the voice of your spirit that tells us to be still, to wait, and to listen. We pray for the people around us who are hurting, who are filled with worry, or even are afraid. Give them your peace. Give them yourself. We pray for people who are not here this morning, those who are dealing with problems and issues. We are concerned about our friends, our family. We will not presume to tell you what to do. Only we pray that your good and perfect will would be done in their lives. That's all they need. We give you thanks for the challenges and tests that we go through. We give you thanks for answered prayer. Thanks for the promise that you will go with us wherever we go in, in life. We pray now together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
something you'd like to see God do in your life, I invite you to stand over us and sing this prayer. Because even if you can't see it, He's working. Even if you can't feel it, He's working. morning is found in Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to teach you a paraphrase, a song that paraphrases Psalm 139. We'll sing it through the first verse and ask you to come in on the second verse. You may have picked up some music out in the welcome table. Feel free to use it or do the best you can with just the lyrics and the melody.
needs to be on. There we go. The art of woodworking is, is a, a fascinating thing to me. Wood carving has always uh, amazed me. An artist will take simply a knife and a chunk of wood and then out of that chunk of wood create something of beauty. In that wood, which is obviously very static and, and dead, comes drama and movement and emotion, something that often I would never have seen in it. You may or may not know this, but we have a carving artist in our congregation. Denny Van Gore has been carving for a number of years and is very good. He's got amazing carvings hanging all over his house and in various places. Um, it, it is a fascinating thing to see what he could see in the wood that I certainly could not have. I asked Denny if it would be okay if I went over to his house and took some pictures of him actually carving to help illustrate what, what we're gonna be talking about today. So you're gonna see Denny from time to time throughout this morning, and, and I thank you, Denny. I know he's online um, for your generosity of time and, and your talent. It is actually an old English saying that we have heard so many times that you can't put a square peg into a round hole. The illustration is pretty obvious, even for children who are too young to even talk. We give them games like this so that they can learn firsthand that a square peg cannot go into a round hole. Triangled pegs can't go into square holes and on and on. Many children have been tortured by this game and we keep buying it for them because we know firsthand that this is a reality of life and they should learn its principle as early as they can. The same frustration as a baby or a toddler has over trying to put a square peg into a round hole is the same frustration that we as adults and, and young adults feel when we try to fit into a job that doesn't suit our skills or associate with people who are not compatible with our personality type. So many of us are square pegs in a world of round holes. It's no wonder that we deal with depression and anxiety. No wonder that we are stressed in our careers and, and no wonder that we're not happy in the neighborhood where we are or in the school we've been planted or even in our church. We feel like we are on the outside looking in and all the things that we think we want and need are on the other side of that round hole. But because we can't get there, we recognize that we are the wrong shape. We are square pegs in a world of round holes. There is a barrier for square pegs, however, that is far more important than a career advancement or fitting into a neighborhood or anything else. It is the separation that we have from God. Sin has shaped all of us to be square pegs and we know that God is holy. It's kind of a pun, but I don't mean it to be. The Bible affirms this over and over again. There is only one way for us to have a relationship with God. 
there is one round hole through which we must pass, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through him. The good news is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we can have a living relationship with, with him and thereby have a, a living relationship with God. The problem of, uh, for us is that many of us just don't believe that this is actually good news. We don't see how we could possibly fit into God's big plan because after all, we are square pegs. If we're ever going to fit into God's plan and have a living, vital relationship with him, if we're ever going to be the kind of people that God says that he intends for us to be, something has got to change. Something's got to give. And that scares us because we know that the round hole is not going to change. God's words are harsh in the Bible. He says, be holy as I am holy. Jesus says, point blank in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Yikes. I don't know about you, but when it comes to the pursuit of holiness and righteousness, God makes my square peggishness even more pronounced. I'm not even close to being holy. And perfection, forget it. I don't like to think about what I know God has to do in me and around me in order to make this square peg fit into his holiness. Something has got to go. Something has got to be taken away. God's whittling knife is sharp, and he skillfully cuts the corners of our life that don't fit his perfect will for us. And, of course, we resist it with all of our might. It is ingrained in us to resist God's whittling actions in our life. Now, some of us are like soft wood. We're easy to shape, and, and we long for God's deep cuts of change. But others of us are much harder woods, that require really small whittling strokes. All the cutting and whittling and chiseling and sandpapering, unwanted areas that need to go from our lives. When they're gone, they bring us into conformity with God's will and God's way for us. It doesn't feel good. I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel good to me when God starts to make changes, cuts in deep into an attitude or a, a, a practice or a, a habit that I have found myself in. I want to shout back to him, stop, what are you doing? Don't you know that hurts? That's not the way I do things. There's got to be another way. We don't like it when a piece of our life is chiseled away in some form. Even though we know it doesn't belong, that's because we have gotten so comfortable with our own carnal thinking 
with the sin that so easily entangles us, as, as Paul describes it. We don't like the idea of the rough edges of our lives being sanded away because we think that gives us character. It gives us identity. And frankly, we don't understand the vision that God actually has for us. We don't see what he sees in us. Thereby, we can't imagine what we could become. This is why we don't believe this is good news. We are afraid, frankly, to trust that God is going to do what's best when he takes something away. When he shapes us into a form that we did not envision for ourselves, doing things that is not what we want to do or going places that we didn't want to go. We anticipate that it's going to hurt. And frankly, I don't know about you, but I don't like change. City of Philippi was in the Macedonian region. It's now in the country of Turkey. It was not in Paul's original tour plans, but Paul had a, a dream in the middle of the night of a man who said, please come to Macedonia and help us. And from that dream, Paul recognized that God was speaking. God was making a change. God was whittling at an expectation that he had. Paul, usually when he went into a new city, as he did in Philippi, would go first to the synagogue to meet with the Jews who were there. But there was no synagogue in Philippi. Probably because there weren't enough Jewish men to support a synagogue. He did, however, find a group of, of Jewish people that met together on the outskirts of the city. Most of the people that met together were women. And under Paul's ministry with, with that small group, many of them became followers of Jesus. And they became the core of the church of Philippi, the church that Paul is writing to in the book of Philippians. Church of Philippi faced all kinds of, of challenges. Among them, the way that their numbers grew, these people were not wealthy. There were a few wealthy people in the church, but this was a small church that was very generous, very generous in their giving. They saw the big picture of what God was doing throughout the world, and they participated in it. Some of them were struggling even to put food on the table, and they found ways in which they would help each other. And the Church of Philippi had a huge impact on the church in Jerusalem who were starving. Philippi was a very Romanized city where the worship of the emperor was the religious norm. And as followers of Jesus, the church didn't fit. They didn't fit any longer into the philosophy of most of the people in that city. So you can imagine the challenges that they faced as very secular people came into the church, bringing with them all of these old practices and ways of thinking. There was a lot of whittling to do. To make matters worse, there were false teachers who came from Jerusalem and insisted that in order for the, the Philippian Christians to become followers that they first had to go through the rituals of circumcision of being Jewish. 
it was it was a clash of of huge proportions. It was a real mess. Paul recognized that what he had was a bunch of square pegs that needed to be shaped to fit into a round hole. We cannot lose sight of the fact that Paul was talking in his book or his letter to the Philippians. He was talking to the whole church. He was talking to us with an encouragement, not just for those people, but for us. Just as God whittles the heart of the individual believer, he whittles at the body of Christ. He whittles at every congregation that comes together, shaping them for the ministry that he has for that congregation. It should be no surprise that our calling together, that we as a congregation are going to face challenges. And we're going to come up against struggles and, and deficiencies and needs that we didn't know that we even had. It should not be a shock that God would apply his cutting tools, not only to us as individuals, but to us as a congregation. Because he is shaping us for holiness. He is shaping us for holiness. But be encouraged. Don't be discouraged about the church. There's been so much discouragement in the last few years about being in the organized church. Don't be discouraged. It is Jesus' chosen vehicle, chosen tool for reaching the world for Christ. He's not finished with us. As Paul said to the church in Philippi, he also says to the church today, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and, in, and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. See, the day of Christ will come. This is the day when he will return to earth in all of his glory. And on that day, all of our questions will be answered. All of the reasons why the chiseling and the shaping and the sanding and the polishing was necessary. On that day, he will bring justice that we long for. When that great day comes, God's whittling on our lives individually and as a church will be obvious to us. What was once a square pig will be reshaped to fit into a round hole. A square peg will now fit into a round hole because God has done his shaping and molding and moving what he needs to do for us to be holy. And it is there that we find we are worthy to stand before him because of what Jesus has done. I would like to illustrate the truth, the depth of, of this reshaping of our lives with a very made-up story, a very true, true fact of, of what God is doing with a made-up story. I, I would like for you to think of it 
as a modern day parable. I have titled the story, The Carver. The well-calloused hands picked through the store of rough branches and pre-cut blocks. The old carver was looking for something special, something different. He put aside the softwoods like fir and pine and gave his attention to dense hardwood pieces of oak and maple and mahogany. His pace slowed as he carefully scrutinized each block for its color, shape, and grain, looking for that that spark of an idea that would ignite an inspiration. The choice came down to two blocks of wood. The first was a large, well-formed block of mahogany with a, a, a gentle slope at one end. When he placed the block on its side, he could see in the block a serene scene of a doe and fawn drinking at a quiet pond. The, the gentle slope would form the arc of the mother's neck as she bowed to drink. The natural curve of the grain and the red shadings would make a beautiful scene, reminding him of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Certainly, this would be a nice piece that would give comfort to the busy, overworked, thirsty for God people who happen to see it. But as much as he liked the idea, the vision did not rise to the level of inspiration. The second block of wood was a white birch that for some reason was very twisted and misshapen. This was not a usual growth pattern for birch, so he figured that the tree must have been traumatized in some way and, and was forced to grow around the injury or, or obstacle. Either way, the piece was very unique and the grain was very dense. He found the piece of wood while on a fishing trip many years ago. Never so often he would pick it up and, and, and look for that, that spark of an idea that would ignite inspiration, but it never did. The gnarled branch piece was really two blocks connected by a branch. He thought many times that, that he would just cut the connecting branch and carve the two blocks as separate pieces. But he could never bring himself to do it because the connection was so unique. Well, he laid the block on its side and imagined an old plow horse pulling a hand plow. The only passage of scripture that he could think of to accompany, accompany a work like that was, it was in Luke 9. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This was not a sentiment that he thought would draw many people to the love of God. Well, he, he turned the block over on another side. A series of knots and bumps on the top of the of both blocks gave him the vision of two groups of people. It brought him back to the days of the old Sunday school picnics when, when two groups of people each pulled at the end of a thick rope with all of their might. The memory brought a, a smile to his face. But the idea of carving the church in a virtual tug of war was a scene that was all too common and did not need to be perpetuated in hard wood. Well, at last, he, he put the piece on end. His first instinct was to say to himself, oh, that's wrong. But that is when he saw the spark. <laughs> he got up from his chair, walked around the table. He saw in his mind an image emerge in the wood that he, he had never seen before. His hands fell on each of the crevices and bumps of the twisted wood. 
He looked at all the angles and lines, the, the course of the grain and the, and the balance points that would be necessary. The spark of an idea exploded into a full-blown inspiration. The old carver unrolled the canvas slotted bag where he kept his knives. There were 12 of them in all with, with various shapes of blades and sizes for different kinds of cuts. A couple of, of, of tall knives had very straight blades that, that would be used for, for very simple, long, elegant lines. Some of them were rounded chisels that would dig round troughs of various sizes. There were V-shaped chisels and small hooked blades. Some blades were very small and others were more substantial. All were well used. We pulled a knife out that he most often used to rough cut the shape of a carving. It was not good for the, the detail work, but was most effective when it was necessary to take away the biggest pieces of unwanted wood. Out of one of the pockets in the canvas bag, he pulled out a sharpening stone. He made long scrapes along the blade on the stone at a slight angle. A sharp knife is a carver's best friend. Then he began the tedious work of forcing the wood into the shape he envisioned for it. At times, his strong hands would even cramp as the knotty wood resisted his cutting and shaping. There were times when he had to step away from the intricate work to again see the big picture and, and recapture the vision. And when he did, his enthusiasm for the work was reborn. When the general shape of both blocks was finished, he began the, the tedious work of the details. He started on the base portion of the project and worked his way to the top. After weeks of careful cutting, and scraping, grooving, sanding, and painting, the piece was finally completed. The carver did not let anyone see the work while he was working on it, not, not even his wife. The day came to reveal his latest, and according to him, the most important carving that he had ever done. He and his wife invited over a whole group of family and friends for a special dinner and the unveiling of the carving. After dinner, they all gathered in the living room where the piece was under a specially made cover on the coffee table. Thank you for coming he said, tonight I want to reveal to you my last and greatest carving. I call it the carver. He reached over and with a sweep of the hand pulled off the cover. The carver was a self-portrait. Sitting on an old chair was an old man who was carving on a small piece of wood. The details in the scene were incredible including his, his reading glasses and his cane and the familiar slump that everyone recognized as the carver. He was wearing his favorite check shirt and fishing hat and had that familiar look of, of intensity. On the little table was carved an open Bible with the words Psalm 139 painted on the pages. The strange thing about the self-portrait was that it was incomplete. Parts of it were finished in his very unique style, but his right shoulder and arm were still in a rough, almost original block state. The soldier and shoulder and arm had a general shape, but in its unpainted, unpolished form were almost grotesque compared to the rest of the scene. Out of the shoulder, however, was carved the blade of a large carving knife. It had once been the connecting branch between the two blocks. His wife recognized the resemblance of the bone-handled knife he most often used to do the fine detail work on a carving. Holding the large carving knife was a hand, a perfect hand that was elegantly smooth, painted, and polished. The hand was so lifelike that everyone marveled at its detail and strength. It was to represent the hand of God. The friends sat in, in stunned silence as they pondered the truth of the carving. The old man opened his Bible, 
and read from Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my, my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before I word is in my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will sh shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. The psalmist prayed, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Certainly is talking about our skin and bone and organs and blood and muscle and tendons and nerves and all the systems and design that makes up the human body. But as you know, we are much more than just organic machines. We are fearfully and wonderfully made with thoughts and reason. We have personalities and intellect and emotions and even a sense of humor from time to time. We have a story. We have come from somewhere and we have come from someone. We have the capacity to learn and grow, to succeed and yes, fail. We can be strong but we can also be very weak and fragile. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And in the making, God is not done with you yet. That's the good news. He holds you in his hand like a carver. And he continues to shape you and form you with all of the complexities of the vision that he has for you. That spark of inspiration coming to life. The whittling and cutting of God in our lives is sure to come. Square pegs have to be reshaped for holiness. It is uncomfortable times it hurts. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense what God is doing. And we shout back to him, stop. Just stop. This is where Paul's encouragement to the church in Philippi, his encouragement to you and me, Anyone who feels like a square peg needs to hear this good news. He said, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is good news. The whittling and cutting of God in your life is reshaping you for holiness. 
So how do you get prepared for what God is doing to reshape you? It actually is very simple. Submit yourself to his wisdom and his genius just as a piece of wood must submit to the carver. Rest in his grip and trust the spark of inspiration that he has for you. And as he whittles away, be patient. Don't resist God's direction and correction in your life. Be thankful. Be thankful for the tools that he has, whatever shape they may be, to reshape your heart to be more like him. Be hopeful. Let the grief of the loss of your old dreams and worldly thinking that God whittles away replace, be replaced with awe and wonder at what he is shaping you to become no matter how old you are. Finally, be confident. Be confident of this. God is not done with you. He will not stop until he completes his perfect work in your life. Lord God, do your perfect work in our lives. Whittle away everything that does not belong to your vision for what you want us to become. Help us to embrace the changes that you make and to actually see the beauty of what you see as you shape us for your glory. We pray this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you, would you stand as we sing again?
my prayer that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and the depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit, the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We'll be having the congregational meeting in, in just a minute, so if you would not go too far, we'd appreciate it very much. <laughs> 